Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fifth international episode of our podcast, Millennials. Today is a very special day, and it's not because it's Friday again, then Saturday, Sunday, what? It's Friday again, but because our today's guest is a champion. So sing it out loud with the heart. We are the champions, my friend. Dun, 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 dun. I mean... I need to admit it's quite intimidating to have a champion with us because I'm not a champion and Denise either. So I'm going to start with an easy question. What is the first thing that comes to our minds when we say the word champion? I mean, for me, it's definitely champagne showers, winner's podium, gold medal, crowds of fans, world records and never-ending fame. I absolutely love that feeling because, well, now I'm talking, of course, about the attention, not that I would ever win anything because, uh, you know, I wasn't a very gifted child. <laughs> in fact, I was always the child that would run in the opposite direction <laughs> and still be kind of slow. <laughs> yes, so. I mean, that is, I'm so sorry that I'm laughing, but I remember you playing basketball and trying all the yes. possible sports in the world and I think you better do podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can do some running, but that's because I don't have to coordinate so much. <laughs> but fair <laughs> enough. Uh, on the other hand, let's personalize a champ, because uh, there are many champs in the world. Like in tennis, we have Djokovic and Federer. In Formula One, we have, uh, I don't know, Verstappen or Hamilton. In skiing, we have our beloved Slovakian Petra Volhova and her rival American Michaela, Michaela? <laughs> Michaela Schifrin. And in gymnastics, we have Simon Biles. So champs are kind of admired for what they do in sports, but they're also heroes to many people. And you know the saying, never meet your heroes. Well, we decided to do the exact opposite and invite you, Alex. So we would like to welcome Alex Kaiser guest. How are you doing? I'm great, thank you. <laughs> That's good to hear. And nice to meet you too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. It's a pleasure to have you here, yeah. And the pleasure is the following because Alex is champion in kitesurfing and uh, I'm going to name all of the achievements that uh, he's achieved since 2006. So let me take a deep breath because that's a long list. <laughs> in 2006, he was the winner of the French stage of the PKR, no, PKRA Speed World Cup vice champion PKRA Speed. In 2007, he was the winner of the French and Namibian PKRA Speed stages, uh, then PKRA a speed world champion, a world kite speed record holder, third best performance ever on water in 2008, world sailing speed record holder, PKR speed world champion again, winner of the Luderitz speed challenge, FFVL French sprint champion, European long distance vice champion, and the list is longer, IKEA speed world champion, winner of the French stage of the PK, PKR are a speed for the uh, and the winner for speed for the third consecutive year since 2006 ffvl french sprint champion yeah i cannot know <laughs> i cannot longer because there's no more air in my lungs so kaki can you please take over in 2017 he was um, a speed world champion again in phoenix card racing association in 2010 world speed record holder in all categories in 2013 world kite speed record holder and in 2017 world kite speed record holder <music> alex do we have it all? Did we forget something? Did we add something? Are you happy with this list? That, that's great. I uh, I didn't expect you do the the full one, but uh, <laughs> uh, no, finally it's uh, it's maybe the, one of my biggest I would say achievement or pride. It's uh, uh, it's probably to to still hold the kite speed world record that I set it up in uh, in 2017. And I'm planning to uh, to blow again uh, this autumn. Oh, you're planning to blow again? Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Never. It's a never-ending story. Yes. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> so guys, I hope that everybody understands that Alex is a champ in kite surfing. I mean, so many titles. What else he could be, right? So, just for the information, the very roots of kite surfing go back to 1977 uh, in France. Uh, so, allez les bleus. And uh, so it's, it's quite a new sport discipline. And uh, it seems that this new generation, millennials, we are bringing about new trends and sport disciplines such as kite surfing. And that's why we have Alex here today in our podcast, Millennials for Millennials, with the slogan, the rest is history. So let's go, millennials. 
now there are too many surfings. I mean, surfing, windsurfing, body surfing, couch surfing. But what, <laughs> a, what about the kites? I mean, as a child, I too was a big kite enthusiast during the autumn in the field in Malacki in Slovakia. But I wasn't surfing and or flying a kite. And I definitely cannot imagine doing these two things at the same time. But with you, Alex, I can imagine sea, waves, sand, sweaty body, salt in your underwear, six pack, bicep, triceps. Am I going in a good direction to describe your sport, Alex? Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's a, what we call the beach sport. So hopefully we are, we are, yeah, at sea on the beach and, uh, and under the sun. So yeah, that's, uh, for me, that's probably the great, greatest sport ever because it makes uh, the the very high level of the sport and at the same time the passion the outside the uh yeah the the communion with the nature i don't know if uh, if i'm clear but uh, yeah you are in in touch with the uh, in contact with the elements and uh, and uh, it's a really w- rewarding uh, sport so now that we have described your sport uh, let's move to the sport man so uh, if you should describe who is he or who is she, what's the body type needed? I think he or she needs to be a pretty good swimmer, someone who loves adrenaline, a bit of danger, which is, of course, attractive and sexy for many people. So what do you think? What is it that makes people good in kite surfing? Like, is there a perfect kite surfing body type? Not really. It depends of the, of the, probably of the discipline of, uh, of kite surfing, because you have many disciplines. You have freestyle, you have surfing in the waves you've got uh, uh, speed or, or big air and uh, we don't have a, a i would say the perfect body type my main competitor is uh, smaller but at the same time uh, way uh, way heavier than me and he's uh, from the us but no you have to of course you have to be a, a very good swimmer and uh, not scare of, uh, of going fast high and uh, and uh, yeah so no 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 yeah, there is no no real body type. I think that it's a matter of uh, of passion and uh, and yeah and taking risk, measured risk. And now Alex a very very uh, important question. Do you definitely need long blonde hair for surfing? <laughs> no 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 it's probably uh, easier to have short hair. <laughs> Uh, I, I, and I think the, the blonde hair comes just with the sun and, uh, and the, the, the sea salt. So, no, 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 there is no, there is no mandatory blonde hair, uh, haircut. Because I wanted to say that, that Dennis, he could be a kite surfer. I mean, <laughs> just because of the hair. <laughs> yeah, because of the hair. Just because of the hair, you can do it. <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I should start. Yeah, I'm 25. Maybe it's too late. <laughs> Just go for it. No, 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 there is no, there is no age to start kite surfing. No. I started at 20, at 21. So it's pretty, uh, pretty late for a professional kiteboarder. But now the new generation, they are like full on at, uh, at 16. Okay. So no age. And my dad is uh, kite surfing and he's 70, 70, almost 71. Oh, so. okay. So Dennis, yeah. we can still be champions. Never too late. <laughs> yeah. 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 But maybe we should start right away <laughs> because, <laughs> because those 16 year old are coming for us. <laughs> They're coming for us. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so maybe like, uh, you already said it that, uh, with certain sports, you're always, uh, in contact with the elements like water and the wind. But with sports like surfing and kite surfing, people might think that you're always on vacation, you know, when you're preparing and when you're training for a competition, because you would usually be on the beach, spending your time in the water, in the sand. Does this sound anything like your training routine or it's nothing like that? It, re- it really depends because, uh, of course, the, uh, the professional career is made either or uh, e- either from uh, competition, uh, training or trips. Uh, I mean, video, video trips, uh, photo, photo shoots and, and so on. And of course, the photo shoots, uh, and, and the trips, they are usually in a crazy, uh, nice, uh, uh, crazy nice places and, uh, with a, with a beautiful sky and, uh, and it's windy and it's turquoise blue water, etc. Uh, but it's just, I would say a part of the, of the, of the routine. Uh, because the, the training routine, uh, when I, when I train in, uh, in France in February and the water is <laughs> under 10 degrees and, and it's blowing 100 k per hour wind, uh, I can say that the wind chill is just crazy and you, and you're just praying to not go 
in, into the water. Uh, and we are going and we are spending hours and hours. So setting up uh, either the, the gear, the material, uh, testing new, new boards and, uh, and, uh, and of course training physically. So yeah, it's, it's, it can be a paradise and it can be a nightmares. A hell. <laughs> Yeah, or hell. <laughs> exactly. But, but of course, the, of course, what we show to, to people, to fans and stuff like that, it's usually it's uh, more the turquoise blue water than the, the cold uh, and the, yeah, the cold weather and the cold water. But how, how many hours do you usually spend a day in the water? Uh, right now it's, uh, it's a little bit different because, uh, I'm, I'm spending a lot of water on, uh, on my new project, but, uh, but before uh, it was, yeah, the, the, the day is, uh, the day rhythm is, is made because of the weather forecast. So if you're waking up and, uh, and it's windy, you go, you go training or you go to the beach. And if it's not, you either uh, spend the, <laughs> the, the morning on your computer, uh, uh, writing emails to your sponsors or, or the press. And then uh, in the other part, you go to the gym and do, uh, like physical training. So. Usually you spend, you spend tens of hours uh, in the water per week. So it's probably three, four days in the water as much as you can. And then on the not so good day, uh, you go to the gym or, or you spend it behind your computer. It sounds like a full-time job that, that you spend like ten, tens oh, yeah. and tens of hours a, a week in the water. Of course, it's a, it's, it was a full-time job. <laughs> I would say uh, one of the best. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's, if it's what you love. Can complain. Exactly. Yeah. It, it removed the, the painful part. Mm. The passion is, uh, is much more, uh, much more important and, uh, and take uh, a lot of the job. So actually you already started my next question, but I wanted to ask you if you, if you also train outside of the water, like do you do some strength and conditioning? Uh, how, how, how do you prepare or do you do some, some other sports that have nothing to do with the water, like football or ice hockey or something <laughs> like that? I never been uh, really into sports. Uh, when I was young, I was doing handball or or judo or those kind of sports, but I was not good and uh, uh, it was not really a passion sport. And when I discover kite, it has been like uh, yeah, a crazy discover. It just uh, blow blow away my world, and and I was only thinking about kite surfing. It was like a drug addiction. Wow. I was like. Always thinking about kite. How can I go uh, in this place? Uh, how can I uh, try this new kite and stuff like that? So it was not. It was only focusing uh, on kite. So it it has been uh, like really uh, like a discover uh, a revelation. So that was uh, I, I was not really into sport before kite before kite surfing. And to answer your f the first part of your question uh, about physical training, you have to because uh, of course when you're young. You just training, you just do specific training and you go, and you go full on kite surfing. But then with the age, you need to do more to straighten your body and, uh, and in, in order to, uh, not being hurt or getting injured. And then you off the water for like three months because you broke your ACL. Uh, so. This kind of, uh, of stuff uh, is happening also uh, in, in a kiteboarding career. Uh, so you have to do a physical training and physical uh, straightening. So I have a, today I have a, a personal trainer, uh, Ludo, who is, uh, yeah, who is pushing me, <laughs> uh, doing like, uh, yeah, doing, uh, stuff you do at the gym. <laughs> so pushing, uh, pushing weights and, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, straightening your body, uh, to not really, be injured and to uh, to better a little bit the cardio part, which is of course when you do competition, you to recover better and uh, perform well. You need to have uh, a cardio uh, at a good stage because I spend a lot of time now uh, behind the desk <laughs> at the office. Uh, I need to compensate yeah. <laughs> as well. So, but it's good. It's good for the brain and of course. And do you do surfing or windsurfing or some other surfings? <laughs> Uh, I, I do snowboarding. snowboarding. Mm. Uh, yeah, snowboarding is, uh, really, uh, one of my, uh, passion, uh, during winter. Mm -hmm. And then I do, uh, a little bit of, uh, scuba diving, but 
uh, you cannot really consider uh, this as a sport, <laughs> but more uh, as a passion. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, actually for this sport, for, guy for kite surfing, it, it seems like you not only need water, like for scuba diving, but you also need wind, right? So w w yeah. what would be like the per perfect uh, kite surfing weather conditions? I would say 50 to 60 kilometers per hour wind. Oh my God. And it's not strong. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Remember that for my, for my record, I need, uh, I need 100 kilometers ah. per hour wind. So you not even go outside your house with that wind. Wow. Uh, but yeah, for perfect, I would say perfect uh, turquoise blue condition. If I got uh, 50 to 60 kilometers per hour, it's just, uh, it's just paradise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, not cold weather, but uh, warm temperature, bright sky and stuff like that. And waves, and waves. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <as well. laughs> waves, we need waves. But um, what, what would be like the, the world's top kite surfing destinations in the world? Uh, there are many, uh, many, many crazy nice spots. Uh, I would say my favorite, my two favorites are uh, uh, in the northeast of uh, Brazil, a spot called uh, Jericho Aguara. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a pretty, uh, nice, uh, place. You've got wind, you've got waves, you've got sun, and, uh, you've got the Brazil, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and Brazilian lifestyle. Uh, it's a kind of a hippie, hippie place. Like the, the hippies from the seventies, they went there, uh, uh, they went there and discovered the place. So, um, uh, you've got a, a small, uh, small hippie community still there and, uh, and the, the, Yeah, the, the condition for kite surfing has, uh, are, are perfect. And the second one would be Los Roques Archipelago in Venezuela. It's a natural reserve, uh, in the Caribbean Sea. Crazy turquoise blue water, pretty windy, really nice lifestyle. You can go fishing. Uh, the people are amazing and, uh, and it's not crowded. It's a natural reserve. So they've, they've got a maximum of people uh, allowed on, uh, on the island. Yeah, it, it cannot be crowded. So if you, if you look at, uh, if you Google, uh, those places, uh, you will see some, uh, some pretty nice pictures. <laughs> nice. And has it ever happened to you that the wind took you really, really high up, uh, in the air? Yeah, I think my, uh, my record must be, uh, over 20 meters. Up in the air? High. <laughs> yeah, up in the air. That's like a whole building. Yeah, seven stairs uh, building. Uh, but it's not, but it's not the record. Now, uh, now people are going, uh, over 30 meters per hour. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what our sport can bring. Is that like one of the disciplines? Like how high you can fly? Yeah. Really? <laughs> oh. Yeah. They've got the big air discipline. Wow. Uh, which is going very high, but, uh, doing a crazy trick when you are the highest. So it's probably the, the most, uh, I would say crazy or most uh, impressive uh, kite discipline for me. Probably the most risky yes. as well, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, that's a pretty good one. What about the equipment? Because like you have a lot of equipment, right? You have the board, you have the kite. Uh, do you travel with it or you just uh, rent it out in different spaces? Uh, when, when you are a professional, you need to have your, your kit. I would say the, all your gear with you. Uh, so of course we travel... Uh, I would say quite uh, heavy, but not that much because a, a kite is probably weighing, I would say between three and five kilos. And we, we travel with at least four kites. And then you have bars, uh, with lines to control the kite. So you probably bring in two and then the boards. So dep depending of where you're going and what discipline you want to do, you're going to take your twin tip, which, which look like it's the freestyle board and it looks like a snowboard. Mm -hmm. Then you can have uh, your surfboard, your foil board, and then the most equipment you, you travel with, uh, you, the heaviest it is, of course. Uh, but usually you travel with, I would say, two board bags. You have to choose quite carefully the airlines you take, mm -hmm. of course. <laughs> and you're going to choose the one you, your favorite one, you know, because we are French, we usually traveling France, with Air yeah. France. And, uh, and because, because, uh, because we're traveling a lot, we have, uh, benefits when you, you know, you have a special card. So you are allowed to take more board bags than, uh, than the, the normal traveler. So. Yeah, it's always a bit tricky. You have to weight your your luggage and stuff like that. But uh, but no, no. If if you are a professional traveler, you you travel with your gear. And of course, when you are not, 
or you go in like special uh, places when you don't have rental center. It happens sometimes. It's better to travel with your gear, but uh, yeah, it's quite uh, quite a bit of management, <laughs> but mm. uh, that's part of the job as well. <laughs> And uh, Alex, I believe that with, with all of this comes a specific diet as well. So my question is, is there a specific diet surfing nutrition? I mean, except for salty water? No, no, no. Of course, we don't, we don't add salt in our food. <laughs> you have enough of it. <laughs> yeah, we have enough. <laughs> Uh, but no, I, I, uh, I never really been uh, into uh, like a proper diet. I love, I love eating too much. <laughs> And I love, t- I love eating shit too much. <laughs> We're the same. <laughs> same. Yeah, but, uh, you know, the only thing, uh, I was careful with, it was, uh, either not eating meat before mm-hmm. competition because it's, it's quite full of toxin and your, your body, uh, the day before it, you spend all the night yes. to digest, uh, the, the, the toxins. Uh, so it's not, it's not really, uh, smart to mm-hmm. do that, uh, the day before mm-hmm. the competition. So, um, try to not, uh, to not eat meat and, uh, and of course not drinking alcohol before the competition mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. After? Uh, but it was, <laughs> after yeah, it? after you can, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Either more beer than champagne, but, uh, but yeah. Beer showers. Of course you can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alex, it, it appears that the envir- environment from which the sportman or the sportwoman comes from influences a lot of their career. For example, our skiing superstar Petra Volhova comes from high Tatras and from the mountains and she's constantly high. I mean, on the winner's podium. And Dennis, when we were children, the closest thing to kitesurfing con- conditions was a one-year trip to Croatia. So I don't think we don't, we don't need to feel bad that we are not champions. And <laughs> Alex, have you always been close to the water? Like, are you like the old man in the sea? Did you listen to the Beach Boys or what? I read the book of the <laughs> This is a good start. <laughs> uh, but no, no, no. I've, I've, I've always been, uh, I've always been at sea. Uh, my parents uh, moved to uh, the small city I'm still uh, living in, called Port Saint Louis. Uh, Port Saint Louis is a small town uh, at the river mouth of the Rhone, beside the Camargue, and it's a windy place. You've got we've, we have uh, yeah sun, and uh, so it's on the Mediterranean side of uh, uh, of the sea, and it's uh, it's yeah it's pretty windy, pretty sunny, and. Uh, and my my parents uh, were windsurfing in the in the early 80s i've always been uh, at sea either to go uh, uh, for uh, to start uh, windsurfing uh, uh, to go scuba diving or, or to do wakeboarding i've always been uh, close to the sea so it's probably because of this that uh, i uh, yeah i start kitesurfing i got addicted and uh, and I started my uh, my professional career, so yeah, it's because of that probably that I uh, I did the the career. I, mm-hmm. I had these uh, last uh, 15 years. Pretty passionate by the sea. <laughs> Perfect. So um, with with the famous sports uh, comes also sponsorship. Are there actually many brands or companies that uh, are interested in sport sponsoring kite surfing? I'm asking because I'm interested in knowing if somebody could make a living out of uh, doing kite surfing only. Yeah, it was the key, it was the key of becoming professional it's because i first did some competition of course i had uh, i would say average uh, rankings and then i become better and better and then i got titles and i got record and that, that's why i got that that i uh, i attracted uh, sponsors so yeah there are there are a lot of sponsors coming into kitesurfing and all kind of sponsors you can have uh, energy uh, energy companies you can have uh, car companies you can have red bull R- of course red bull is playing big part of the in th- in that game uh but all kind of sponsors because we are just driving so cool energy and so cool uh, values uh we are at uh, at sea we are into the nature we are using uh, sustainable energies uh we are pretty cool people and uh, and also accessible you know yeah. we talk with people quite uh, we are not uh, like uh, i would say football players that don't yes. want to uh, answer the interviews or questions so it's because all of this that uh, that uh, sponsoring is coming of course it's coming into kite surfing and it's of course part of the of the of the equation if you have uh, sponsors uh, that can uh, make 
uh, you uh, a possible living with your with your passion it, it works so that's why I got sponsors and uh, I could make a living uh, of kite surfing and and fully trained and uh, all year long training and uh, and then it's it's uh, you get small spo- I would say a small sponsorship at the beginning and then bigger and bigger because you you driving press articles mm. and stuff like that and you you show the sponsor the the logo of uh, of the sponsors into the into TV's interviews so that's why you can you can get all the bigger sponsors and stuff like that so and make a living nice so let's talk about kite surfing again <laughs> like we have ever stopped <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly no i like this <laughs> But I, I just wanted to ask, because we've already started uh, talking about it a little bit, but I was just wondering about all the disciplines that there are, because I, I, I believe that there are different disciplines and also they're divided by weight or gender or, or how does this work? Of course, I, as I told you before, there are many disciplines and of course they are usually uh, divided by gender. So we have uh, uh, the freestyle sport with a 20 board. It was the first uh, kite discipline. And then came uh, the surfing one doing uh, uh, maneuvers into the waves and it's really close to like normal surfing then came the speed and i think the last one was the the what we call the kite racing so it's a slalom between uh, buoys mm. uh, like olympic olympic format i would say okay that's one of uh, one of the good stuff for kite surfing is that in the next olympic uh, campaign so in 2024 mm-hmm. Kiteboarding will do their first appearance yeah. uh, in in kite foil racing. So uh, you have uh, like special kites. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a, a special board with a big fin under mm-hmm. uh, that makes you fly. It's called the foil, and it's quite impressive. Of course, the French the French pride <laughs> the, the French guys are the best. Actually, we have like uh, I think in the in the top five or top ten uh, we have uh, like. Four guys, wow. so it's, that's impressive. We are we are quite a, a cool nation mm. uh, for for kite for racing, and and the cool stuff is that uh, the 2024 uh, Olympics will be held in Paris, mm. but the sailing will be will be held in uh, in Marseille, mm. so where I'm working right now. So we will have the the, the competition uh, at home. So that's. Uh, that's a good stuff. That's amazing. What about the French women? Are they in the top of the kite surfing competition as well? Yeah, in the, into the top 10 as well. I think the best French girl, I think she must be top five or something like that. So Isn't she uh, Kevin uh, Meyer's uh, girlfriend? I'm probably not. No, no, I don't think. I, I, I'm not sure. May, maybe, but uh, I don't know the, the private life of <laughs> Kevin. I know I know. He's, uh, he did a really good results <laughs> yeah. yesterday. Silver medal. So a lot of pride again, but I didn't know that her, her girlfriend was kite surfing. So I will, I will look <laughs> okay. at, her, I will Google it. <laughs> so no, actually, it was. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that you answered already the Olympics one uh, questions because we were going to ask you about it because there was already a new discipline which was skating in in Tokyo 2020. But it, it, as you said, like it's going to be held in Marseille, so it depends, I guess, on the on the weather conditions as well. Because in Paris, we're going to kite surf on <laughs> on the river, maybe. But <laughs> yeah, for a short moment, we are talking about uh, La Rochelle, mm. uh, which is on the Atlantic coast. But of course, it's uh, much more cloudy, much more cold. So it's better to do it in Marseille. Marseille will be crazy weather in uh, in July. It's pff, the best spot in uh, in France. Nice. A part of sporty times is also what you are wearing. And I guess you've heard about the situation with the Norwegian beach handball players that refused to wear prescribed a clothing saying uh, it was too sexist. Uh, so Alex, what do you wear when you're kite surfing? And have you ever thought about sport clothing in, in such a way like it's too sexist or I'm showing too much? I'm, 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 or I'm covering too much. Like, have you ever thought about it, or you just don't think about this stuff like this? Ah, uh, we of course uh, we are we are at the beach, so it's quite. Uh, I would say the bo- the board short style is quite important, <laughs> and the 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 very important stuff is uh, either you wear your board short uh, 
over uh, or under the uh, under the knee. That's the only thing uh, it really matters. Uh, but to make it short, uh, for the the wearing of uh, of swimsuit when you do uh, volleyball, the, uh, volleyball or handball, it's they must have the possibility to wear just joggings if they want. You know, I I really cannot understand the problem, and uh, and I really blame the the fe- the international federation that just don't say. Uh, Hey girls, you can you can wear whatever you want and whatever you're comfortable with. Exactly. For me, it's just uh, unbelievable to be uh, to to have a problem here. But uh, now, for us, to be honest, I I, uh, I would say 70 percent of the time I'm wearing a, a wetsuit uh, because if you spend hours in the water, it's uh, really hard to be just wearing board shorts and a t-shirt or lycra. But no, the, the, the problem of uh, wearing, uh, uh, we don't have a wear problem. Uh, uh, it's just some places when you don't want to get sunburn all on your body and you're wearing like long sleeve uh, shirt. That's, uh, that's the only stuff. Especially in Los Roques uh, in Venezuela where the water is so, uh, so turquoise, the sand is so white that you, you, you can get sunburned under your hands ah okay wow and uh, that's that's just crazy so you have to really be protected and you've got the fishermen there and uh, we learned that uh, from from them they, they, they're wearing uh, like um, like a masks or something yeah a mask but li- like a lycra mask uh, you you can wear it in a snowboard in during winter because it's too cold they've got exactly the same thing but with the lycra and they've got a hat, so they just have, and wearing glasses, so you've got no part of your body exposed to the sun. And more, and you, you would see a, a lot of guys in kiteboarding and especially in kite racing, they're wearing those, ma- those masks, uh, because of the sun and, uh, and the, the reflection on the, of the water. Uh, and, uh, it makes a huge difference to protect uh, your, your skin. And yeah, I lost, I lost, uh, Quite a bit of, uh, for years in my, uh, sun capital. <laughs> we call this, you know, my skin took uh, way too much, uh, sun uh, during my career. So now I have to be even more careful. Tokyo Olympic Games will be soon, very soon over. When this is uh, going to be out, they will be very much over. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but this year we have uh, witnessed in gymnastics, uh, Simon Biles, who has uh, announced her withdrawal from all the competitions. Uh, but she was actually very open about the fact uh, that the reason why she withdrew was mental health and mental mental pressure and the whole world was on her shoulders. And um... and meanwhile, COVID was watching from far saying, no, it's on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, COVID was like, am I a joke to you? No, but uh, enough of jokes. Like, it's a serious topic. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh, how, did you experience any of this uh, mental pressure and uh, maybe maybe some sort of... Uh, uh, problems or what do you think about this? Do you, do you have some sort of opinion? Yeah, of course. Uh, I never experienced what uh, Simon uh, had in her past, so for sure I, I cannot be uh, I cannot uh, be in her mind, and uh, and I completely understand that uh, that those kind of pressure it's uh, can it can really uh, affect your results and your your passion or, uh, or just the passion to go on the, on the field. So I, I fully uh, understand. And the, the competition is, of course, uh, the mental part is, uh, is always playing in the result of the competition. Um, the mental preparation is a part of the game. The pressure you put on, the, on, the, on your opponent, it's part of the game. Of course, the pressure you put on your shoulder uh, it's part of the game. So it's, for me, it's quite difficult to compare to those kind of sports uh, that are like hyper exposed. For us uh, in kitesurfing, it's, it's quite, we are a really a niche sport. So we don't have as many fans as uh, Simon got. We don't have the same kind of uh, media exposition uh, that they got. So no, it's more, uh, it's more the pressure you put on your shoulder. Uh, the pressure of good results because you want, you don't want to lose sponsors. You, do, you, you really want to get, uh, uh, this title in your pocket because you know that uh, it can bring, uh, some new stuff, uh, on the table. And, uh, for me, it's more the, the, the pressure you put on you, uh, um, to get rewards because, because of all 
the efforts uh, you put in place uh, to do your best for for months. And for me, the the record just lasts 16 seconds. So it's a lot of work uh, to do to get the the fastest uh, 15, 16, 17 seconds uh, uh, that can make the difference. So of course you you put you put a lot of pressure on you, uh, but it's no, it's nothing compared to uh, what Simon uh, uh, got on her back. When you, for example, when when do you feel pressure? How do you cope with it? Uh, for me, the the pressure uh, you can remove it when you are really really good prepare. If you check all all of your to do lists. And you, you just put the uncertainty, uh, with the weather. Uh, either you, you're gonna get the weather you want for a record. Uh, if you do, uh, all your preparation or, or your physical preparation of your material preparation, uh, all your, the volunteers that are gonna help you, uh, during the day, uh, etc., etc., uh, and you leave the uncertainty just for the weather. It's it's good. It's part of the job, and you 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 don't have any more pressure. Uh, if you feel you are ready for for the day, it's the best preparation uh, you can have. But do you have a, do you have a mental coach or somebody somebody to talk to? Because you know it's a safe space. You can be very honest. You can tell us anything. I go to my grandmother whenever I need to talk. If you need to talk to her, I can give you a number. She's she's gonna be <laughs> she's gonna be very helpful. I promise. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. That's nice. But. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got my dad. Basically, my dad is my, uh, it has been the main support I had all my career. He's not a mental coach. He's a dentist. So nothing really, uh, uh, compared to a, a, a real coach, but uh, he has been followed me, uh, all my career. It helps, it helped me, uh, uh making some choices. And, uh, and of course, he's, uh, always, uh, behind all my record attempts. And he's helping me uh, a lot in terms of logistics and and support, uh, uh, mental support. He is trying to do his best to put me into the the best condition. So uh, when I do the record, I just have to focus on uh, what I need to do uh, and to be to be able to concentrate only on the sport part to be as uh, as free as possible. Do you think that climate change is going to uh, affect your sport or if so, how? Of course, uh, I think climate change will uh, will affect uh, everyone. So it will probably affect my sport. But it's, if it's if it could only be my sport, I would be very happy. But uh, but no, the, the climate change affect uh, affect everything and everyone. Probably in changing of uh, maybe the, the windy season in some places. Where I live, we had, we have the Mistral wind, uh, which is very famous and it is blowing all year long. And in the old days, the old people, they were saying that, uh, it sometimes the Mistral was blowing three days. And if it blows more than three days, you said, you said that it's going to last seven, seven days. So a week. And then if it blows more than a week, it's going to last for two weeks. And it's like the old, all people that uh, that are saying that, and you know, 30 years ago it was like that. But today, Mistral winds. Sometimes it's blowing one day, and je- and never more than three days uh, in the row. So we know that uh, that seasons are changing and stuff like that. So it's it's quite uh, it's a bit scary. And of course, where I live, I have a, we are really uh, at the at the sea level. And Camargue is a very uh, flat land. So if the level of the sea rise for, I, I don't know, 50 centimeters, for sure we are under the, we are under, we, we will be flooded. That, that's a, that's a bit scary and um, it will affect for sure all the water sports and then uh, all the out, uh, outdoor sports in, in general. Alex, I have a question that I wanted to ask the whole interview. My family and I would go to the lake each summer since I was a little girl. And for me, my whole life, I was so scared that some sort of catfish and not the one on Tinder is going to grab my leg and drag me under the water. 
And I'm talking about the lake in Slovakia, so I cannot imagine how it must be in the sea or in the ocean. So do you also keep a lookout on animals like uh, sharks, jellyfishes or, or orcas? Like, are you scared of these animals or are you just in balance with the ocean and zen <laughs> on kite surf and stuff? That would be uh, lying to say that uh, you are always zen. <laughs> uh, for sure, it depends on the, on the places you are kite surfing. If you are kite surfing in Cape Town, so in South Africa, uh, you know that there are sharks. To be honest, I never witnessed a, a shark in, uh, in, in South Africa. So, uh, except in the, in the cage, you know, in Guns Bay where you can uh, dive with sharks. Uh, but it's the only, only time I saw sharks in the water in, uh, in South Africa. So, but you know that they are there. There are never been a kiteboarder attacked by a shark in South Africa. So, of course, there have been uh, surfers attacked by, uh, by sharks but never kiteboarders. You're too fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, too fast, but sometimes you swim. Eh? Oh. Sometimes it happens to me to swim like for one hour and a half uh, to, reach, to reach back the shore. I'm telling you, I was, I was really scared about sharks. <laughs> but how do you swim with the kite? Uh, and sometimes the wind drop and the kite drop into the water. So you have to swim back. You have to swim back to the, to the shore. So it happens sometimes. And uh, I promise you, uh, I did a, I, sh I record a video on my GoPro. I was swimming and I was like, dude, my parents, I love you guys. Uh, if someone uh, recovered this <laughs> GoPro, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so that was, no, that, that, it happens to me once. So, but the, the only big fish I saw in, uh, in South Africa was uh, uh, sunfish. You know, like we call this moonfish in, in French. Uh, poisson lune, but, uh, but like big one, I would say two meters diameter. So it's monster fish, but they are so cool. They are so nice and uh, they are the, the nicest fish ever. They, they, they are quite slow and they have a, a huge eye that look, <laughs> uh, looks at you. Um, but they have the same fin as a shark. Oh, okay. So the only, th the, the only fin you will see in South Africa when you kite boarding, it will probably be, uh, a sunfish. Uh, and I, that's, that scared a lot of people, but I love to go, the, to go and check, uh, and check those fishes because they are like the, the coolest fish ever. So, and they are quite, it's, it's quite impressive. So you do have a favorite fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but not to, <laughs> not eat. to eat, just to look at this, uh, this kind of fish, you just, uh, you just uh, look at them and, uh, and try to, uh, to exchange with them. And it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, funny. So now we're talking a little bit about the dangerous stuff. And uh, was breaking the 100 kilometers on water the most dangerous or the, or the most terrifying stuff that you've done with kite surfing, or did you have some 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 even more dangerous uh, stories to tell? No, I I think of course the the 100 kilometers per hour it was. Uh... I cannot even imagine it. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it, uh, but you know the brain it, uh, it gets used to it. That's a thing. If you are used to go 99 kilometers per hour and then you go 100, it doesn't uh, really make the difference. So to be honest, you get used to the performance and you go faster and faster and your brain is, uh, uh, is, uh, is getting used to it. So it's not that crazy to, uh, to reach. Then it's the more the safety part, which was a little bit tricky at the time because we were in a, in a small town uh, in Namibia called Luderitz. The organizer, they dug a, a trench there to be able to have, uh, to, for us to get very flat water, even when the wind was blowing really, really strong. The trench was a little bit narrow. So that was, uh, maybe the, the less safe part of this adventure. So today we are the trench I'm using, uh, in, in south of France. So at home, uh, it's eight meters wide. So it's like much more safer. Uh, so it was probably at that time, it was a little bit uh, dangerous in South Africa. But I think the, the most uh, scary part, I would say it's uh, when you're not uh, comfortable with your uh, gear. Uh, because we are professional, I'm using uh, quite a lot of uh, prototypes <laughs> that are not really uh, uh, safe sometimes. So when you go in 100 kilometers per hour wind and you have a kite that doesn't behave and it becomes dangerous, then, then you, it's a little bit scary. 
because you, you cannot handle it and it's difficult to handle and uh, and stuff like that. So it's that part must be uh, must be one of the of the scariest and and probably when I do wave riding, so I go in uh, in waves. Probably ten years ago, I was uh, uh, in Cape Verde visiting my friend Me Too Montero, which is uh, like one of the most uh, famous uh, uh, wave kite borders uh, in the world. He's a local from uh, from the Sal Island in Cape Verde. Basically, he's born in, into the waves, and and he brought me one day, which was like the the swell of the of the decade in Cape Verde. So yeah, we had like monster waves. And I took the biggest set of the day with him. So he told me, you know what? The first wave that is coming, you don't take it. The second wave, you don't take it because it's coming in sets, you know, like uh, uh, three, four, five, uh, five uh, waves in a row. So you don't, the first one, you don't take it. The second one, you don't <laughs> take it. The third one, you start thinking about taking it and maybe you take the fourth <laughs> okay. one. And at least if you fall, you don't get all the waves coming into into your face and uh, and destroying you and and drowning you. I took I think the fourth wave of the set, which was the biggest, and of course there were uh, there there was a fifth one. <laughs> and hopefully my friend me too uh, Montero was on that one. So we took the two biggest waves of the day, and uh, and it happens the the wave was more than eight meters high, so it was. The biggest wave I ever took in my life. Oh my god! Wow! And that was going like a ski downhill. <laughs> I, I never experienced that uh, again because usually we were riding like one, two, maybe three meters wave, which which are uh, quite uh, quite big. Uh, yeah, that's already pretty big. <laughs> then the bit of eight meters, it was. Huge and all the, I could hear all the people uh, <laughs> shouting on the beach like, <laughs> and that was yeah, that was a little bit scary. So I did like a straight line uh, downhill, <laughs> and uh, and my friend me too was like destroying the wave uh, after me, and it was yeah, one of the probably one of the coolest uh, coolest experience. I ever had in my life in, in kiteboarding, but at, at the same time, probably one of the scariest. For how long did you ride the wave? It didn't last uh, long. Uh, it was uh, maybe 10 seconds or something like that. Just going like full, fully down. But I got the coolest picture ever. Can we find it somewhere? I want to see the picture. Yeah, yeah I, will, I will send it to you. Please, I want to see the picture. Okay, so Alex, uh, is there anything on your CV that we haven't talked about yet? Well, except for the whole list of the of the championships that we have named, is there anything on the CV that you would maybe like to talk about? Because we also know that you're not doing doing only uh, kite surfing, but other things. Yeah, uh, maybe because uh, I um, I launched a, a project called Sirocco in 2019, so two years ago. In Marseille again. And the idea of Sirocco was, uh, the, the idea behind at the beginning was, uh, how do I get back the outright world sailing speed record? Because right now I have the second best time ever on water using my kite. It's still kite surfing world record. But today we have a boat called Sail Rocket driven by an Australian guy. And it's the fastest boat ever on water. He is, uh, I think his record is 121 kilometers mm -hmm. per hour on a straight line. And uh, when he set it up his record in 2012, we were, yeah, just a bit more uh, faster than 100 k per hour with the kite. And I knew since that date, I knew that uh, it was impossible to get back the record using simply my kite. You know, it was too dangerous. It was... Uh, uh, the, the kite is a, uh, it's a really fast way to break the record, but it's, it won't be the fastest anymore. Uh, so I had to be, uh, in a, in a cockpit, protected by a cockpit to be really safe and using a new concept to go really fast. And that was the, the beginning of Sirocco. It was because I, I need to, to build a craft that will carry me, uh, along the record. I need a team of engineers. Basically, it's not uh, it's not anymore. You, ca you cannot find a shaper that's gonna shape you a, a nice board and you go in the water and, uh, and break records. It doesn't work like that to go to be the fastest ever again. Mm -hmm. 
So I start talking with people about this project. I start uh, uh, building a team around me that uh, are coming from the entrepreneurship, uh, big data startup world. And this because I was a, a, a sport director at a think tank called the Galleon Project. Basically, I was bringing entrepreneurs all around the world to kiteboard and to exchange between them uh, on the good practice, how to build big companies and etc. So I mean, successful companies. Finally, I've been mentored by those guys. Uh, of course, the kite part was uh, really cool. I was uh, helping them becoming better, etc. But they were also coaching me becoming a, a new kind of entrepreneurs because for, for them, that was the funny part is that for them, I could consider me as an entrepreneur. For me, it was not the case. I was doing my, doing my stuff and, uh, and getting my record, getting my sponsor, etc. But I was not, I was not considering myself as a real entrepreneur. And, uh, and finally, I've been coached by them. Talking about my project of, uh, uh, building a speed craft that will, uh, blow, uh, the, the, the sailing speed record, etc. Uh, they told me, you know, in, we can help you. Uh, we're not going to help you, uh, uh, on the marketing or not on the, on the sports side because you are probably the best one to do that. But if you have a, a, an idea of a business model behind this project that could make the project live way longer than the, the record, maybe we can help you. We know how to, to raise funds and, uh, and to make uh, like unicorns from uh, from those companies. So I, I talk with them, and, and so we set it up a team, and we brainstorm a little bit on the business model of uh, of what could be Sirocco apart from the from uh, from the speed record. And we ended our uh, brainstorm with the idea of uh, uh, those challenges. Uh, the sailing speed record or going around the world with a solar airplane like Solar Impulse did and Bertrand Picard did. You need to create innovation to make this, uh, this record, this uh, achievement possible. Uh, and this innovation, uh, you're going to try to make product with it uh, to help uh, the maritime transportation, uh, for example, the maritime transportation becoming greener because we are all passionate by the sea and those this this universe of maritime transportation they didn't make their ecological transition we know that uh, the impact of maritime transportation is getting uh, bigger and bigger on the planet and they need radical innovation to to make it uh, more sustainable and finally we're going to use those kind of challenge the speed record the project but also launching new challenges with Sirocco. we're going to use those changes to drive innovation and breakthrough innovation. And, and that was the real business model of Sirocco. Of course, we will have a sponsorship business model like I did uh, uh, all my career. Uh, so uh, uh, exchanging the brand exposition uh, uh, against uh, uh, finance. Uh, but also we will have a business model of uh, products that we're going to launch. Uh, we're going to sell it to a maritime transportation world and and make it at the same time it's, it it would be a real business model we will get money from that uh, we will get investors and those people they will think about uh, our project like a driver of uh, of profits uh, but at the same time profits for the marine transportation uh, uh, transition so it was a real business model uh, behind Sirocco and so we launched the company in 2019 today we are uh, advancing in our in the development of our speed record uh, speed craft and and uh, we are designing a machine that will uh, carry me and a co-pilot at 150 kilometers per hour on water <laughs> oh. safely okay. safely Oof. and we will blow we will shatter the world record <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the plan for the next years but at the same time we, we are developing uh, new methods, we are, we are developing a software platform, we are developing products, and we are talking with the maritime transportation world to, uh, yeah, to make it greener. So it's a, it's a really re rewarding project because we have, I have a team of 20 people now 
caring about uh, the impact they can bring on the table and uh, and that's uh, that's a super uh, yeah super rewarding uh, mm-hmm. rewarding project it makes the passion and the impact you can have uh, and that was uh, that was uh, I was looking for all my career it was like okay you write your name in in the history of the sport that's really cool but then at the end so what Yeah, did you did you change the world? Did you and and today I think uh, uh, it can be either the founders of of the company, my partners, uh, the people that are working in the, in the tech team on in the marketing side, etc. Yeah, they they all want to uh, to have impact and uh, and and change the world, and that's uh, yeah, that's make the the Sirocco project so so exciting, and uh, and uh, we are very proud. I, I, Alex, this is actually really amazing because this company allows you to still be in the ocean, and you also can use the knowledge and the skills that you have acquired during your car surfing years in business. So yeah, what else? I mean, it's perfect. You have the passion, you have the business, you have everything. Yeah, it's cool. So it's a good transition from a sports career to uh, what you can bring into the world and uh, yeah and try to make a change yeah, yeah exactly so alex you you have a very colorful life you never stop working you're a hard working man uh, you hold many 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 titles but you're still very young do you have do you have any other things on your list of things you still want to do Apart from the company, apart from the sport, do you have still like I don't know? I want to climb Kilimanjaro or or something. Do do you have some other plans? <laughs> uh, first, I want to have baby. Ah, okay. Yeah, so that's the plan right now. We are expecting with my uh, with my future wife. We are expecting. Uh, mm, congratulations. congratulations. <laughs> uh, a kid uh, for yeah November December. So I will have a we will have a, a, a pretty packed uh, end of the year. Uh, pretty busy. It will change your life, yes. Ah, it will change, uh, yeah. It will change uh, our life uh, a little bit for sure. A new record, a uh, new kite record, and of uh, yeah, approximately the same, uh, the same time. So I would say <laughs> November, <laughs> November will be very packed. Uh, new kite record, and then next year, uh, next year the record with uh, with Sirocco. For sure, there are many places that I, uh, that I would love to visit. I really never been to Asia. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably the the yeah the only part of the world that I didn't uh, that I didn't visit. Recommended. I, I really miss. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it's. Uh, of course, we saw many many videos, many articles, and uh, and there are many places, very very different places that uh, can change your life. Be careful because I got the food poisoning in Asia, ah. but it's it's a very beautiful yeah. place. <laughs> Me too. I think everybody did. Of course, but you can get uh, you can get food poisoning almost everywhere in the world. Huh? <laughs> I've, I've got <laughs> my friend, uh, my my partners who, who got uh, like a sushi infection in in south of France. So. You can have uh, po- food poisoning everywhere in the world. Uh, of course, you need to be, ca- be careful of. Uh... And, and so, so, Alex, do you think that we're going to see you in the Olympic Games in 2024 in Paris? No, no, no way. <laughs> I, I will be too way too old. And and there are t- today. <laughs> uh, I, I was as I was telling you, uh, there are many talented uh, young guys. They are right now. They are between the the four guys I'm thinking about. The the four best in the world. They are between. Mm-hmm. I would say 24 to 26 years old. They will okay. be around mm-hmm. 30 years old uh, for in 2024, and they are like way way better than me in the, in that discipline. So I leave them the 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 place. Maybe I will be a <laughs> commentator. Who knows? Nice. Uh, yeah, maybe, but um, but no, no, no. I leave the the, pl- the place to young people. <laughs> I think you already did enough. So. Yeah, you did so much for the sport. Yeah, I did my part of the job. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> We're coming to the end. We would like to thank you very much. But before we end, we have one question that we ask everybody. And um, the question is, what would you recommend to our listeners? Maybe something to watch, to listen to, maybe something to try. Would you recommend kitesurfing? I guess, yes. <laughs> of course, of course. I, uh, it's, it's still my, my main passion in, in life. So after I started kiteboarding in 2001, so it's, uh, it's been 20 years that I'm kiteboarding uh, almost uh, every day. And I, and I, uh, 
and I cannot get uh, used to it. Uh, I cannot get bored with it. Yeah, so yeah. I really, really, really recommend to start kiteboarding. So that's a really, uh, for me, the best uh, nautical sport ever. So yeah, start start kiteboarding, but not alone. Don't go to the shop, buy a kite, and uh, and go into the water. You have to do a, uh, you have to pass by a school. So mm. this is the main recommendation: is uh, go to a kite school. Uh, we have uh, a lot of kite school in France, uh, but all over the world. Uh, so go there, uh, learn how to kite, and, uh, and then enjoy. Yeah, and uh, and read the book, The Old Man and the Sea. <laughs> yep, <laughs> from Hemingway. Yeah, just in case you are stuck on a boat. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Denis. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Alex. It was a pleasure. Seriously, I yeah, it. same. So thank you guys for listening to the fifth international episode of our podcast, Millennials. I just, guys, I just still can't believe that I just have a talk with the world champion, the speed record holder, and as if all this wasn't enough, a CEO of a Zero Collab that will blow with speed records and disruptive innovation in maritime transportation in the future. And I can tell you now for sure that this episode was definitely not the last one because we have already another very talented Frenchie in our repertoire for the month of October. We hope that you enjoyed this episode, that you laughed with us and that you are going to try kite surfing. And don't forget the advice of, uh, the advice of Alex. Don't do it alone. Do not definitely mistake the moonfish for shark and take a GoPro with you in case you need to swim in dangerous waters and want to record a goodbye message for your loved ones. <laughs> and for myself speaking, I will just start with some snorkeling to get rid of my shark phobia. In case you have any questions or suggestions, Just shoot us a message at millennials.podcasty at gmail.com or on our social media account. This podcast is made in cooperation with the Theatre Falangir and we would like to take this opportunity to say hi to our fellow actors and actresses. So see you next time! Oh, I'm already so excited! Yeah, right? We are the champions, we are the champions, na, 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 cause we are the champions of the world. Denise, I really want to be a champion. My life sucks. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs>